Hey everyone, uh, my name is Eric Tharmalingam. I'm aware that's quite the mouthful, so you can just call me Eric. Um, today I'll be talking about compressed air energy storage. So I'm a researcher at the University of Waterloo, if the slide didn't give it away already. Uh, I'm part of the geomechanics group and we're a larger team made up of electrical engineering students, mechanical engineering students. Uh, we also collaborate with the University of Alberta as well as the University of Calgary. So we're a very large interdisciplinary team looking at this problem. So today I'm going to talk about a case from Ontario's perspective. So we're going to cover Ontario's need for storage. Uh, then I'm going to briefly introduce CASE as a concept and its key components. Finally, we could talk about the design framework um, that me and my colleagues have been working on for about a year and a half now. And then we'll do some quick number crunching with our first order design. So I'll be looking at places in Ontario to implement CASE. So when we think about Ontario's need for energy storage, we can look at it from the demand perspective. So what you see before you is an IESO plot of five consecutive uh, business days. So uh, this is like in the month of March. And some things stand out here. For one, we could see a very obvious peak behavior. Um, so we know that it costs more to run our dishwasher or laundry machine at the start of the business day. At the end of the day, this is not new to us. But what really stands out on this curve is that it's very, very hard to predict demand for the entire Ontario grid. So what you see here is a 24-hour clock, uh, the megawatts in demand. And we could see from day to day, it's very, very hard to predict. Uh, so if you were to look at, say, Tuesday versus the Friday or the Thursday at the end of the day, you see very different off-peak behavior is significantly different uh, on-peak behavior as well. So another uh, incentive to look into Ontario energy storage is because we need to be able to manage our intermittent energy sources. So these are things like renewables such as wind and solar. Um, and although they've been great for the greenhouse gas reduction initiative that we've been pushing forward with as a province, uh, we have to accept the fact that wind and solar come embedded with an intermittency problem. We can't always predict how much the sun will shine or how much the wind will blow for a given week. So we have to accept that these power sources have a stochastic nature. So if you're trying to match stochastic power demand with a very hard to predict demand curve, uh, you run into a bunch of problems. Another incentive is that we want to manage peak behavior. During our business day, we have peak hours, and then while we're all asleep, we have off-peak behavior. Currently in Ontario, we're running around with our operator trying to match continuous demand and supply. This may not be the best strategy, as we already know it's very hard to predict but demand behavior. So what you could do instead is run something like a load like this at this level, use our off-peak hours to charge our storage facilities, and then discharge when it's time to meet that demand. And of course, with some flexibility for storage, we can maybe match our demand more accurately uh, as we do have the option to charge and discharge depending on our demand. And then all of this leads to a huge reduction in curtailment. So for those of you that don't know or aren't really familiar with electricity or the Ontario power industry, curtailment is a term that they used uh, for discharging for free. So when we're producing way too much power on our grid, uh, well, below our, sorry, well above our demand, our operator tries its best to export power to places like Michigan or Quebec for dirt cheap. But when they don't want to take our power, what do we do with it? We kind of just let it go into the ground. So as rate payers, we end up losing up to a billion dollars a year uh, for curtailment. So we're telling a bunch of power producers just to go offline and because they're breaching their contracts, we end up having to pay them to go offline. So where does CASE fit in all of this? CASE can be thought of as a mechanical form of energy storage. It's usually most effective in the context of 10 megawatts of power to a gigawatt of power and hoping to deliver energy on the scale of hours. Um, when most people think of power storage, they tend to think of things like batteries, your car battery, your laptop battery, or even your cell phone. And this would be uh, sort of a chemical battery. This would be lithium ion or a lead acid like in your car. And these are great for sort of small scale power, but when it comes to delivery, uh, you're on the scale of minutes. And this isn't really adequate for a grid. So why can't you just scale up a battery to meet the grid requirements? Well, you run into a number of issues. For one, batteries tend to decay, so you have a shorter asset life. Also, um, when it comes to disposal, you have to consider that huge amount of lithium you're about to dump into the environment. So it's much better to go with something mechanical like compressed air energy storage. An alternative to compressed air, a great proven one, is pumped hydro. So this involves uh, using an existing reservoir dam. You pump up water and that's how you're storing energy mechanically. It's like the force of the head that drives the turbine, just like a classical hydroelectric dam.
So what is case in practice? I've spent a lot of time talking about the need for storage as well as where it fits on the grid. But compressed air energy storage involves taking electricity from the grid, um, perhaps on the off-peak hour or from renewables. We use that electricity to drive an air compressor. So we take ambient air, pressurize it, and with that pressurized air, we send it down to some form of a vessel. So here we have a salt cavern. It doesn't necessarily need to be a salt cavern, uh, but I would argue that they're the most prominent solution. And once we're comfortable with our stored air and we want to harness power later on, what we would do is simply release a valve, allow pressurized air to go up and travel through a generator. So the force of the pressurized air from compression to expansion is what drives the turbine. This turbine will produce electricity and then we use that electricity to feed the grid. Um, there are a few caveats. For one, it's the heat problem on the compression side. So when you think of, say, pumping your winter tires or whatever, we know the tire heats up as you add pressure. That's pretty obvious. But if you were to have an incredibly hot pressurized gas in salt, something like a salt cavern, maybe not the best idea. So what we would want to do is run a number of compressors in series. So if you could imagine a, mu a bunch of machines in series, and then we allow for some heat exchange. So we try to cool the gas as best as we can. Uh, you'd be looking at like a temperature of about 300 Kelvin when you're in the cavern. That's usually ideal. And then when it's time to expand the air, it turns out that it's way more efficient to heat up the air first before you pass it through the expander. Also, uh, when you're dealing with uh, compression to expansion, you have cooling, and with cooling comes icing in the machinery, and this stuff tends to be pretty expensive, so it's better not to play with ice. Uh, so this is where we make the distinction between a diabatic natural gas system, so you introduce natural gas into the air, use it to heat up just like a regular gas expander, and then voila, you have electricity. An alternative to the diabatic system would be adiabatic. Uh, I haven't really included it in this figure here. So it involves some form of heat recovery uh, elsewhere, like a, or, sorry, a geothermal reservoir, or if you were to take waste heat from the compressor and then reintroduce it with some heat exchange into the gas. So the nice thing about CASE is that it's uh, proven technology. It's been around for about 30 years in Huntorf, Germany. Uh, they have a 290 megawatt facility. This delivers power for three to four hours of output. And then in the United States, uh, in McIntosh, Alabama, they have a 110 megawatt facility uh, delivering 22 power hours of output. Um, and to give you some context, OPG has the smallest hydroelectric dam at 0.8, and our largest is about 1.4 gigawatts. Uh, Bruce Nuclear, which is sort of northwest of us, which we all, I'm sure we all are familiar with, produces 6.2 uh, gigawatts. So where do we store our air once we have it compressed? There's a number of options. Uh, my research group is certainly not shy about admitting that solution mine salt caverns are by far the best. But if you were to do something else like a porous aquifer where you simply drill down with a pipe, uh, send your pressurized air down, and this will uh, s sort of push the, ca sorry, push the aquifer downward. And when you want to harness the power later, you just release the valve, allow the aquifer to push the air back up and push it, pass it through your turbo machinery. An alternative would be uh, abandoned hard rock mines. So you just repurpose the mines such that you're comfortable storing your pressurized gas in there. Uh, there's also surface storage. So this would involve essentially a giant metal tank on site. Um, of course, you can imagine sort of the amount of quarantine that would go into sectioning off this huge hand grenade on your surface. Uh, then you could do something like a cased well bore. So this is where you just drill down with metal casing, plug it with concrete, and then voila, you have your pressurized vessel. So the reason why we lean so strongly towards salt caverns is because we know they're impermeable. We've been using them for hydrocarbon storage since like the 1940s. So we know there's very little chance of leakage. We also know that they're relatively strong and we have the option to shape them with solution mining. And then when it comes to that large, large scale of storing a gigawatt of power, it turns out to be relatively inexpensive. So you're comparing manufacturing and fabricating this giant metal tank versus simply solution mining. So in Ontario, we're lucky enough to have some salt formations, and we've already talked about the Unit B uh, earlier today. Uh, so in Sarnia, we have a 90 meter thick deposit. Oh, sorry, right here. Uh, it starts at a 610 meter depth, and from a geomechanics perspective, we tend to look at something between 400 meters below the surface to 800 meters below the surface. Uh, in Goderich, Ontario, we have a 70 meter thick unit, and the depth starts at 390 meters. And in Goderich, they're currently working on a compressed air facility for storage. Uh, cool project. <laughs>
So once we know where our salt is in Ontario, and I've sort of mapped it out on here, it's the gray hatched boundary. So we want to be able to service the grid as best as we can, and this turns out to be a huge optimization problem. Uh, this is something the electrical team at Waterloo is working really hard on. They currently have an IESO model. So you're trying to optimize uh, your energy potential, so this is where you harness your power, uh, the electric demand you meet, uh, so this would be in terms of the operator, the IESO, and you want some adequate infrastructure. So you want to be near the right transmission lines, and they're kind of plotted here. Uh, and also, if you were to go with a diabatic system, you want to have some proximity to a natural gas line. Uh, then we can get into the shape and size of our caverns. So we go with the traditional vertical long cavern, uh, so its length is along its vertical axis. Uh, this is what's been used in Huntorf and McIntosh, Alabama. It's, easy, it's easiest to solution mine, but if you're not lucky enough to have a deep salt deposit, or sorry, a thick salt deposit, you could do something like multiple cylindrical caverns. So if you were to have four of these to match the volume of this, you'd have a solution. But if you have an even thinner salt deposit and you have this insane demand for energy storage, you can do something like a long horizontal gallery. Um, so you could think of sort of a childish analogy of a hot dog versus a hamburger. Uh, these are much harder to solution mine. It's way more complex, but again, depending on your environmental constraints, it's, it could be a viable option. So we look at some geomechanical considerations. Uh, for one, we care about roof failure, cavern closure, bed slippage, and cap rock and cavern wall fracture, wherein your pressures would bust the rock that you're working with. It turns out uh, that minimum pressure is the most critical parameter. And this is because when you're working in a halite, rock salt medium, uh, things have the tendency to creep in on themselves. So when you have a minimal pressure, like something like zero MPA, uh, the cavern walls will slowly shrink in upon itself and you completely you lose your acid. Uh, so we do have some rough reference. Uh, we want to be operating well below 80% of the fracture pressure. I think the regulation to date is 75%, so we're certainly in the same ballpark. Uh, and a minimum pressure above 25% of the lithostatic. Again, we're trying to avoid cavern closure. So from there, once we know our maximum and minimum pressure limits, we could look at our mechanical equipment. So this is a dresser rand axial airflow compressor, uh, sort of a cross section just to show you the components inside. Uh, as far as machinery is concerned, we have two phases. We care about compression and expansion. Uh, both of these have their own machines and their own temperature and inlet pressure constraints. We're also looking for things like turbine and generator efficiencies. Uh, so it turns out that a lot of the technology is off the shelf. You could call up some place like Dresser Rand and order uh, a machine right away. Uh, of course, it could probably cost you a lot, but you don't need to customize anything. It's already built for you. So, the bulk of my research has led me to this, a volume calculator. And it's really funny how four months of research could show up on sort of one slide. But what this calculator attempts to do is compute a volume for your desired power output. So this would be the megawatts and the duration of output. So we get a megawatt hour. We take into account things like the thermal constraints, so a diabatic system versus an adiabatic system. So this would be natural gas versus no natural gas. Uh, the desired schematics, so I'm looking at a horizontal gallery versus the vertical cylindrical cavern versus a storage vessel. I care about the upper and lower pressure limits as well as the temperature it sits at. And then uh, we care about turbine efficiencies as well, things like that. And finally, we have our volume at the end of it all. So to give you some context, I've crunched some very, very rough numbers using my calculator just to illustrate the effectiveness of case and where it would fit. So we have sort of our three locations, Sarnia, Goderich, and where we are right now, London, Ontario. Uh, this estimated storage is probably the roughest number I've calculated. In reality, you'd want to do some form of grid optimization. But what I've done here is do, done a per capita, per person uh, usage of power in Ontario, then multiply by the population, and then you do 5% because you're trying to get 5% uh, of the base load for storage. Uh, I use the same mechanical equipment across all three cases. And so this is what I've come up with. So in Goderich, where we have a 500 megawatt hour need, we're using a horizontal cavern, and I've come up with dimensions like this. So we have 37 by 37 by 51. 51 meters running sort of along the horizon as opposed to in depth because we're working with a thinner salt deposit. In Sarnia, uh, Lambton County has a larger population, so we have nearly double the power demand. We're going to use a vertical cavern, so this just goes downward. And I've crunched some quick numbers, and I've come up with essentially a cube, so 53 by 53 by 53. Uh, these are very, very large caverns, keep in mind, but we are trying to service a huge power demand.
Uh, finally, in London, Ontario, it turns out we're at, uh, outside of the practical limit of salt. It turns out the salt below us isn't deep enough to really work with it. So we could get away with using something like a cased well bore or an abandoned hard rock mine, and we come up with probably the vi biggest volume. Again, we're trying to service a huge amount of power here. And with that, thank you very, very much for your time and attention.